Uh, so, um, I want to take this, uh, this time just to um, give you an overview of what IOSK Research does. Um, I should say that uh, um, I was at a meeting in Zurich uh, where um, we were discussing many ambitious plans about what research in blockchain can be in the next couple of years, and I was happy to say that I couldn't find a single topic that IOSK was not already doing something about. So um, let me just tell you what is uh, happening now in terms of structure at IOSK Research. So the operation is following a hybrid model where basically we do have in-house research basically what will be IHK research and what you, some of you will be familiar from the website. And then there is what I call embedded research, which is research taking place in collaboration with IHK, funded by IHK in academic institutions. So this uh, means it, collaborations with individuals, researchers that are working at academic institutions, but also funding of blockchain technology laboratories, which means that these are research units uh, which are funded as a whole by OHK, but as well as other funders. So we have three research centers in Edinburgh, Athens, and Tokyo Tech, and a number of other embedded researchers that are in different locations, Denmark, Bratislava, Kiev, and Petersburg. Furthermore, we do have collaborations with universities, UIUC, UConn, Oxford, and Lancaster. And this is what we have right now. This is something that is uh, growing. As we speak right now, we have a number of negotiations with universities uh, and individual researchers for either them joining ISK Research in-house or expanded our embedded research program. Now, this concept of embedded research is something that works well for, I for ISK because it's important that research happens in a research environment. Uh, and given that IHK doesn't have a single location, it's important to have our researchers working together with other researchers in other topics. So there is a very nice opportunity for collaborations that is taking place in all these different institutions. So what is the methodology of IHK research? Well, obviously, as being researchers, we submit papers and participate actively in peer review. Then we perform wide dissemination, no patents, no restrictions, support the free flow of information for blockchain research. So because the intention is to contribute and ultimately evolve the science of this whole community as a whole. So that's important because we feel that this is the role that IOHK will play here. And as such, we acknowledge and we incorporate great ideas and approaches that are contributed by everyone. We are open. We don't advocate for an orthodox way. What we advocate is for the principle, for the approach. And this approach leads us to a number of research themes that we're currently uh, pursuing. So uh, in this presentation, I'll just walk you through all the different uh, research topics that are currently taking place in, um, uh, within our um, different research groups. So I'm not sure if you can read that well, uh, especially in the back, but I'll just uh, uh, you know, say hopefully the next slides are not going to be that tiny. It's just that I wanted on that slide to have all the different things we do. And apparently it was hard to get it a bit larger than that. So what we have first is research on the settlement layer. So basically that means whatever happens at the back end, our blockchain protocol, consensus. And there is a lot of topics there like 
defining security properly, incentives, networking, scalability, verification, high assurance. Moving on, the contract layer, connecting to field stock, programming language research, developer support, dealing with legacy code that exists in the larger ecosystem. These are some of the main questions we care about. We also do research in proof of work, and this relates to how do we connect with blockchains that are based on proof of work, and we have a thread there with uh, uh, Pagin. Um, wallet research that touches on various security aspects and usability. Applications on top of the settlement layer and the contract layer, which starts right now on implementing secure multi-party computation, thinking about privacy, zero knowledge protocols, SNARKs, and hardware support. So these are like major research themes, and now I'm just going to take to, to specific projects that are um, currently underway. So, Ouroboros is the main backbone of the Cardano blockchain. And this was one of our um, important research achievements. We published this in crypto 2017, August of last year. And it was implemented, deployed in October 17. I would say this is the most remarkably fast transition from a crypto paper to a full working implementation that is used by tens of thousands of people. Um, there are other examples. The previous examples in the past were counting in years the cycle from basic research to deployment. And here we're talking about months. So I think this was a remarkable achievement on its own that required the collaboration of a lot of people, both on the R and the D side of the company. Um, Ouroboros, as it is now, which we can call the classic version, as there will be more versions coming up, it utilizes a fixed core node infrastructure. And basically what happens in terms of stake is that all stake is force delegated to these core nodes. This is something that we will change uh, as prescribed in the protocol itself. And the new release of the protocol, Shelly, is going to be decentralized in contrast to that. So here is what's going to happen. Stake pools will naturally emerge by delegating stake between stakeholders. And for this to happen, we should be able to delegate and revoke delegation. And that should be true for all stakeholders. Um, there is very active research thread on that, and there's going to be also a presentation. The solution we are converging right now is a combination of what we call a lightweight and heavyweight certificates, which basically you use the blockchain itself as a way to record um, who trusts whom, who delegates to whom. This naturally gives rise to stake pools, but also give, naturally gives rise to many interesting questions about the stability of the system. We would like to also accommodate different delegation capabilities. For example, enterprise addresses could have a special form that would result to their delegation treated differently compared to regular users. Um, the question that keeps us up is how to provide secure and effective control of staking to the end user. Now, this is an important feature of the system. The system being decentralized basically means that the user has control of its stake and making sure that it's possible like, to have an effective way for the user to command the way that stake is assigned and used in the protocol is an important perspective. If we fail there, it's going to result in a system that is not truly decentralized as we would like it to be. 
And this, of course, brings us to incentives, because understanding the incentives of the stakeholders that operate the protocol is critical to understand its security. So classical cryptographic security treats the entities of the protocol in two categories. The honest parties that do follow the protocol, and then the adversary, who is, if you want, a coalition of parties that act together and try to subvert a certain feature or a certain property of the protocol. This classical approach to thinking security just divides the world to good and bad. And of course, the goals of the adversary and the question of why does the honest party follows the protocol is not something that is being addressed. Which brings to rationality. So the game theoretic approach does not distinguish between good and bad. It just assumes that parties are rational and then it poses a certain utility that will help you understand the objectives of every party. So this leads then to mechanism design, designing the protocol with a certain set of reward structure that will incentivize rational participants to operate in the way that they should. So a first rendering of incentives was in the analysis within the Ouroboros paper, leading to what is called a fair blockchain, basically a blockchain that can faithfully record uh, the actions that participants take. And in other words, if you take a certain action that is expensive for you, this will be reflected in the blockchain. And me, as another participant that may want to prevent the blockchain from recording that, I will not be able to do so. So this is just a first step towards providing a fertile ground for a rational game theoretic analysis to take place, which is what we do right now. So in the Shelley release, or by the Shelley release, we would like to have a first version of our game theoretic analysis being completely ironed out. And what is going to happen is that the code is going to include an incentive um, structure which is consistent with proper protocol behavior. So the question here is how to make decentralization, proper decentralization, the inevitable out outcome of rationality. And this is a difficult question that actually has not been addressed before. And this is an important research theme that I should say we're head on making progress here. And that's something that I think will have a lot of intellectual merit on its own. Moving to network research. Well, it's good to go back to this Nakamoto quote back from 2009. The blockchain itself takes advantage of the nature of information being easy to spread and hard to stifle. It's a great quote, and that quote needs to be supported by a network layer that does it. So it turns out that the network layer that, that we have right now is only in optimistic conditions supporting that state. So what we have is a peer-to-peer -peer gossiping type of setting, which is subject to a number of attacks. For example, Eclipse attacks uh, is, is a great example. And such attacks exploit the peer-to-peer -peer nature and the peer-to-peer -peer fashion that uh, the fully connected graph, if you want, emerges and manage to isolate parties and disconnect them from the network. So obviously that type of attacks hurt consensus. Consensus can only be achieved if you have actually this ability to spread information easily without being 
uh, possible to stifle it. Uh, and furthermore, this should happen at regular intervals. It cannot just be arbitrary the wait times uh, that information is being spread. And clearly, what we have here is a performance reliability trade-off. So a very important theme of our research would be providing reliable message transmission in this peer-to-peer -peer environment. Right now, the whole blockchain um, world is based on peer-to-peer -peer protocols that have been developed in the last 20 years. Nevertheless, it's time that substantial more research is put into making these protocols robust. So this is another important research direction. Which brings me also to security under extreme conditions. Um, we're making a lot of convenient assumptions when we analyze protocols uh, in the blockchain setting. And there are many um, conditions that are happening in an actual deployment that are going beyond the security models that have been considered so far. An instance is that for nodes shut down or wake up in mass. Or there are temporary network-wide splits that temporarily divide stakeholders in non-communicating subsets. Or you have temporary 51% attacks, so-called 51%. So when suddenly, basically, the adversary commands more uh, than the, uh, let's say, usual allowance the adversary has. So the question is, all these things are typically outside the security model. And they are outside the security model because the usual and customary conditions of the system's operation, these things don't happen. But when you have a long-lived system that is going to operate for years, you cannot actually exclude instances where such, catastrophic instant, where such catastrophic events might happen. They might be small in the temporal sense. So in other words, they can just be very short. But just because you're outside the security model, there's few things that we can say right now about how the system is going to behave in this. And this is what we want to solve. Can we retain the basic security properties of our model? when um, such extreme security conditions take place. All right, so moving on to other features that are important. Right now, we don't have uh, multi-sig support uh, in our transaction layer. And this is an important deficiency that we're very actively trying to fix. Um, providing multi-sig support is more complex compared to the Bitcoin uh, setting. Remember that signatures in our setting are used in a much more involved fashion compared to the Bitcoin blockchain, or similarly proof-of-work based blockchains. Your balance, the money you have in the system, your stake in the system, is both a cryptocurrency and your right to participate in protocol execution. So you have to answer, like, what, what, what is the meaning of that uh, when you move to the multi-sig setting? So it turns out that it's possible to have staking and spending keys with different threshold structure, and it's possible to fold a multi-sig uh, type of uh, uh, um, capability within our existing um, address definition. Um, still, providing a fully functional multi-sig support would require synchronization between the multi-sig owners, and uh, this is a problem that we are actively trying to solve. So this is an immediate, uh, something that is immediate. There is a lot of demand for having a multi-sig support in our transaction layer, and that's something that we would like to solve. And it's important to solve it in the way that's user-friendly because uh, the synchronization aspect of multi-sig is something that can hurt the usability of our wallet. 
So moving on to protocols, our next version of the protocol, Ouroboros Prowse, Prowse, Greek word for calm, is um, what we, the work that we recently completed and will appear in Eurocrypt 2018. And Roboros Prowse provides a number of improvements, both in the design of the protocol and the security model uh, that uh, Ouroboros has. Very importantly, Ouroboros Prowse has, operates in a partial synchronous model, which is comparable to Bitcoin, so its needs for synchrony are much less than Ouroboros, and that could be something that we can exploit uh, in the deployment, in easing some of the requirements we have, for example, like the size of the slot. Uh, it has very efficient random number generation, and it provides something that in cryptography is called adaptive corruptions. So adaptive corruptions is the analysis of a protocol in a model where the adversary can corrupt parties in an adaptive fashion. Um, so the adaptivity of the adversary was restricted in our analysis of Ouroboros, and this was something that was an important open question we left uh, in the crypto paper with something here that we have addressed. Another version of our protocol, Ouroboros Thos. So Thos means fast. And this is an ongoing effort right now to provide an evolution path for our implementation. So Roboros Prowse introduces a number of new features uh, in our uh, basic protocol stack. And uh, implementing them all at once is something that uh, uh, would be unwise. So it's important to provide a a way for the code base to evolve. Um, so Roborostos is a version of the classic Roboros protocol that uses the idea of a hash-based random seed generation from Roboros Prowse, but otherwise leaves other parts of the system the same. So it's a first step in the evolution beyond a Roboros classic and the first implementation that we will do um, going beyond the blockchain uh, that we have right now. So an important question that uh, our research team is trying to answer right now is that what are exactly the side effects that grinding attacks have in this setting? Some of you might be familiar with the concept of a grinding attack. A grinding attack is when the adversary tries to use computational effort in a proof of stake protocol to bias some events on the protocol to their advantage. Um, so grinding attacks were an important question in the context of proof of stake protocols, and one of the important contribution of the Ouroboros protocol is that it neutralized them by using a simple secure multi-party computation protocol that produces randomness. So it turns out that we can speed up this process further and substitute the multi-party computation protocol scrape used in Ouroboros implementation with a faster protocol, which now would have complexity just linear um, or essentially optimal in the length of the protocol segment that the random number generation is applied. Nevertheless, this comes at a price that these grinding attacks return to the, to the threat model, and we know how to control them, and we would like to control them and provide a model to control them that is very tight. So these are exactly uh, the main research question behind this. And I should say that that question is important because it really affects how much you have to wait based on your risk model and the threat model for a transaction to be confirmed. So Ouroboros has the virtue that it gives you a very precise wait time 
for how long you have to wait for a transaction to be confirmed. So for example, in Ouroboros you can say, I have to wait for five minutes to be secure against an adversary that has 10% of the total stake, and I will be safe except with error 0.1%. And that's an absolute statement. That statement is proven uh, in the Ouroboros paper. And the nice thing about this statement is that by its very precise nature, it gives a simple way to communicate to a user of the system of what is the level of safety that is provided. This is the same thing that we have to do now, but we have to do it again. Because the faster random number generation is, uh, brings back some additional attack capabilities that we have to control. So this brings me now to security uh, of these protocols in general. So far, these protocols have been analyzed in what in cryptography is called the standalone model, where basically the protocol is studied in isolation, like it's in a glass box. You just look at the protocol, and then you say, I'm studying the execution of a protocol, putting the protocol in a box, together with the adversary and the parties that are operating. Um, now, there are numerous examples in cryptography where a protocol is analyzed and is secure in a standalone setting, but when you compose it together with other protocols, it stops being secure. And that's because it's possible for an adversary to play between different sessions or other uh, protocols that are running concurrently. So a high standard of security is called universally composable security. And for the case of Bitcoin, it was shown for the first time in crypto 2017 in the work of Badetzer, Maurer, Trudy, and Zikas. Uh, so there is an ongoing research effort to understand what changes would be required in a protocol stack to transition from standalone security to composable security. Next generation of a protocol, Uroboros Hydra. So Hydra is a multi-headed serpent. This is a picture of it. And it's basically what's going to provide sharding for Ouroboros. So um, sharding is an important question in a database context. And it's something that so far has not been addressed in any uh, fully um, deployed system. So the main idea in sharding is to split the into multiple ledgers, which are maintained different subsets of stakeholders, but still maintain the view of a single ledger. So basically, this captures a true scalability. The more servers are available in terms of number of resources, proportionally you get more performance. That's something that is not captured uh, in uh, existing blockchain systems that are deployed. Nevertheless, there are a lot of research efforts to bring that concept of sharding to the blockchain context. And of course, when you think about it a little bit, the difficult question here is how to ensure secure cross-shard transaction effects. So because if there are no cross-shard transaction um, you know, connectivity, then it's obvious that you can just take a blockchain and split it in parts, and as long as they're not communicating at the application layer, at the transaction layer, of course, uh, the whole system would trivially work. But the difficult part is that such interactions, well, cannot be, um, cannot be excluded, and the hard part of the protocol is actually to um, show them that it's possible to have it secure. Next generation of a protocol, Ouroboros Philos, which uh, Philos meaning in friend in Greek, 
which uh, deals with side change. So side change is an important research direction. The idea is that different blockchains can actually support move the movement of assets between them in a secure way. Right now, we are in very active research for what I call side change generation one, where basically you think of the main chain, and which is Cardano, and then different side chains are supported by different sets of stakeholders that support the main chain. So having the capability of using side chains is an extremely powerful idea because it gives naturally the ability of the system to support, for instance, different scripting languages or um, different types of assets. You can contrast this with side chains generation two, which is going to be our next uh, um, objective, where um, you will have blockchains that are supported by completely independent subsets of parties. The fundamentally different question here, the fundamentally difficult question is that you would like to protect other chains that are connected to a certain chain that has its security collapse. So you can call this the firewall property uh, for a side chain. This is the main difficult question about security. And the next one is that we would like side chains to be safe even at their initial stage where potentially very little support uh, might be in them in terms of stake. So these are questions that are actually we're addressing right now, and we do have a sidechain proposal um, that uh, hopefully we will be able to implement uh, relatively easily with our existing code base. So a sidechain presentation is also planned, so if you're interested in this, um, you should attend it. Post-quantum security. There is a lot of... Uh, interest in and pressure, I should say, to understand how is it possible to design such systems to withstand a quantum attacker. Um, clearly, having a post-quantum digital signature is a necessity. Just remember that Bitcoin's digital signature is not quantum secure. And there are a number of approaches right now for post-quantum security that are pursued. As a matter of fact, NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology in the US, is running a competition right now as we speak. And uh, uh, that competition is for selecting the, a suite of uh, different uh, cryptographic primitives that are post quantum secure, including digital signatures. So, unfortunately, the research that needs to be invested here goes beyond adopting a digital signature. The reason is that getting post-quantum security goes, it's more complicated than just dropping replacing um, a digital signature functionality with a post-quantum one. So just putting a post-quantum signature will not be enough because it will not capture what a quantum adversary might do. So this is a, a, another active research thread of trying to understand the threat model against a quantum adversary. And I should say that right now, uh, we are in the process of, collab of starting a collaboration with one of the teams that submitted a NIST uh, proposal for a post-quantum security digital signature so that we spec um, the requirements we have in our transaction layer and then engage in research that will lead to a post-quantum version of uh, Ouroboros and Cardano eventually. Multi-asset support. Right now, we are doing all our analysis, assuming a single asset, which is the home asset, let's say, of the ecosystem, but the next level would be to install and manage new assets. Compatibility with ERC-20 token specification, but we should go beyond that. 
what types of other assets that we should support. And assets here could go beyond with what is like a currency. For example, like an identity is a very different type of asset with its own features and it's important to understand exactly what are the properties that we need for, for that. So that gives you um, a picture here for how the Ouroboros protocol is going to evolve. So where we are right now is, is here, in the Byron release of Cardano and the implementation of Ouroboros. Um, and that's the, the evolution of the settlement layer. Uh, the Shelly release, together with its incentives, will bring us to that space. And from that space, we have a number of directions that can be taken. Features like uh, multi-sigs or multi-assets can just be added. Um, but what you see in the middle here is a number of different possibilities that, that can happen. The uh, entry point is Ouroboros Thos, which is the simplest way to take the Ouroboros Classic protocol and make it faster. And that's going to happen when we completely understand the security model that I was mentioning before that has to do with uh, how do you control grinding attacks. And then once we're here, we have a number of other improvements in our protocol in terms of the settlement layer that can actually be applied in any path. We have to find the best path. That's actually an important uh, uh, discussion, both from a research point of view, but also from a development point of view. Because some of these paths are going to be, let's say, more painful than others. Uh, an important discussion to be made between the R&D of IHK is to figure out the best possible way that uh, we can roll in new features in the protocol um, as, as we try to make it better. Uh, and I should say that all that are just before we have the contract layer or other privacy enhancements that can happen with next releases. So in other words, the contract layer can actually be sitting in any of those uh, nodes of that graph. So this is the approaches as we've been doing it so far, but we have also to now to look forward and see what next. So something that's quite important is high assurance implementations. So, so far, the current state is that the implementation matches the protocol pseudocode as a best effort. We have a paper which is peer reviewed, published, et cetera, that has the protocol as in terms, in the form of a pseudocode. And then you have a software implementation. And whether the two match is basically best effort. So someone or a number of people, they sit, they interact over Slack. There are people in the research part of the company, the development part of the company, there is interaction, and we try to make sure that the code matches the, the, the pseudocode. But of course, it's just best effort. So this has to be done in a principled way. So high assurance will try to bridge the gap between pseudocode implementation in a verified fashion. So the, pseudo, the pseudocode itself should become a human verifiable formal specification, and then the implementation should probably provide the same functionality. And obviously, um, this is something that will, developing the methodology of doing that in itself is, uh, uh, is a challenging research uh, question that we are currently uh, very actively engaged in. Um, and this is only one aspect because just making sure that the pseudocode itself is uh, implementing the same thing as the implementation is only one dimension. Then the next thing that you have is that the pseudocode as published in the paper is associated with a number of theorems that argue the security of the implementation, uh, the security of the pseudocode. And now the question is like, are these theorems correct? So another dimension of formal verification here is actually formally verify these theorems, formally ver verify these properties that, that we claim. Right now, these are pen and paper proofs. So a high standard in, in defining security is simulation-based security. 
So I'll just give you a little glimpse of what is simulation-based security. So you have an ideal functionality, which presumably describes what is your objective, and then you have a protocol pseudocode. So supposedly, the protocol pseudocode matches the ideal functionality, like implements it. Now, what we would like is that in the presence of an adversary, it's possible uh, to take any attack that can happen against the protocol implementation or the pseudocode and simulate it so that it's an attack against the ideal functionality. The main concept here in simulation-based security is the fact that essentially any attack that happens against the protocol can be simulated into an attack against the ideal functionality. And because the ideal functionality is ideal, no really bad attack can happen against it. So this is the pinnacle of uh, our cryptographic security right now, which is at the level of universal composition, which boils down to that statement. And I'll just read that statement for you um, that basically says, for any adversary, there is a simulator so that for all environments where the implementation is going to run, the random variable that describes the execution of the protocol in that environment against this adversary is indistinguishable from the execution of the ideal functionality with the same environment together with the simulator. Now, this is a handful. This is like a, a mouthful. Um, but this is the pinnacle of defining security in modern cryptography. And now what's fascinating here is that this is a um, pen and paper uh, type of definition that in a vision uh, that I have for formal verification of these properties is to be able to provide a methodology and a way to formally verify such proofs. So here what's going to happen is that we have the ideal functionality, which is the ledger, and we have the implementation, which is our protocol, and that implementation is in the form of a formal spec that we believe that it's exactly what we intend to do. And what we would like is to establish that connection. So here we have the implementation, which is at a certain abstract level as a formal spec, and that's the actual thing that is being executed. So we would like to make a connection here, and that will make sure that whatever you see on paper, formally specified, is actually what's running inside people's computers. And that has to be done via a successive refinement process, where this syntactically becomes closer and every step is formally verified equivalent to the previous one. At the same time, this is not enough. We also have to show that this implementation matches that idea of functionality. And we do have, the nice thing is that this universal composition framework also enables a successive refinement step. Now, I understand that most of these concepts will be, um, no, you, most of you will not be familiar with this concept, but what I would like to have as a takeaway from here is that there is right now a body of literature that tries to lay out how to properly define security, and what is missing is a principled approach for doing formal verification uh, of these security properties. So it is possible to do them at that level, and that's an ambitious uh, research uh, vision uh, which I hope IOSK Research is going to contribute. So what's happening here, actually, is, is a nice observation that this concept of successive refinement can actually play a role not only in formally verifying that the implementation or the pseudocode matches what is running, but the proof of security itself can be achieved via a type of successive refinement. And uh, this is a nice observation that I hope we're going to be able to exploit, and I'm very happy to discuss it further for those of you that uh, you feel that this is uh, something that they would like to know more about. All right, so I'm moving on faster because there's a lot of stuff. Um, another dimension is the update system. Any distributed uh, piece of software Doing software updates is challenging, even if you have full control of the code base. Of course, it's a nightmare when you try to do that in a system which is deployed distributively. And we've seen like examples, manifestations of that problem in hard forks, for instance, that happen in Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. So being able to handle software updates in a decentralized fashion is extremely important. And when you have this partially updated system, you can ask, what are 
its security properties. So can we see updates as an extension of our sidechain system is, an, is a concept that we try to understand. And the connection between updates and sidechains is that, you remember, sidechains are extensions of our main chain. By taking, the, taking this point further, you can think of a sidechain being essentially more important gradually over time than the main chain. And perhaps the side chain can then take over and the main chain will die. Now the side chain will be main chain and will have main chains of its own, side chains of its own. So this is a, a way of transitioning uh, which could be uh, useful to think about it in this fashion. And that's something that we are actively considering. The treasury system is the ability of the system to govern itself. And there's many interesting questions there about deliberation, participatory budgeting, that points to research that has been done in the past in what, in some cases, it is called liquid or representative democracy. Um, so there's many interesting questions about that. And there is a thread of research that we pursue. Basically, it's like privacy, coercion resistance, and verifiability of the outcome. So how is it possible to do that? Um, so there's going to be a, a presentation about Treasury. And uh, this is something to say. If, if this type of governance is something that you're interested in, uh, you should attend. Um, as I mentioned, we also do proof of work research. And this is related to side chains. This is very important for Ethereum Classic, and it's also important for interfacing with other blockchains. That's important, in other words, also for Cardano. And uh, uh, this work is, uh, has as the main thrust right now the pegging between uh, proof-of-work-based ledger. An interesting pegging example, for instance, is uh, having been able to move um, assets from Bitcoin to Ethereum Classic. Uh, but there's other interesting examples of uh, uh, using this construct that we have, and we call them non-interactive proofs of, proofs of work to create these connections between blockchains. The contract layer, I'm, go I'm not going to say much, as uh, uh, Phil covered this uh, um, in the previous talk. Um, but needless to say, there are too many interesting uh, questions re related to... Uh, designing uh, the scripting language and the smart contract language, and ultimately too many interesting research questions about developer developing uh, these smart contracts. For example, how to ensure that programming intent is captured in the contract code. Um, wallet research. Many interesting questions about how do we secure uh, our wallets. I'll just like point to some of the interesting questions like searchable encryption, for instance, is a capability that enables you to discover the addresses uh, that are controlled by the wallet when you process the blockchain. And it's a capability that we would like to allow the user to have, for example, when uh, they, are, they have lost their implementation or they would like to uh, use their mnemonic key keyword sequence to uh, restart their wallet, enable the user to have multiple devices, and doing all that while preserving usability uh, is, is a very interesting research theme. Uh, other questions about wallets, which I'm not going to cover, but I'll just say very briefly, is like having paper wallets and having paper wallets so that they are secure. What's the right security model for a paper wallet? And what is the security model for a threshold wallet? So a threshold wallet basically is a wallet which the secret key itself is never stored in a single position, and it's threshold shared between different devices or shareholders. And of course, like when you have this, you have issues of proper synchronization. Um, and it, on all that would just basic blockchain support. Applications top of the blockchain would be the next one, which says developing MPC applications that can be readily deployed. Or MPC is secure multi-party computation and is the main secure protocol um, construct that we can use to build applications on top of a blockchain. There's very active research on that. The main application, the first application is poker and gambling games. 
And there is a Kaleidoscope uh, protocol for poker, which is going to appear in, in Financial Crypto 2018, uh, General Card Games, Royal Protocol, and fully understanding the security of these protocols is an important research direction, uh, which is our natural next step. Whatever I told you so far was not even touching the concept of privacy. The current status is that our system is susceptible at least at the transaction layer to the same attacks that you have in Bitcoin in terms of privacy. So you can cluster transactions, you can do mining on transactions. And th there's like pressing questions about how do we compare with privacy preserving ledgers like Zika, Monero, and so forth. Um, and that's only a, a first level because they talk about transactions, but privacy preserving smart contracts is the natural next question to ask. Um, I mean, ultimately, a question to be answered here, there are so many directions to go, and the complication, the complexity of the protocols is so high. So the question is like, what types of privacy is required for our intended applications? Next question, hardware-assisted ledgers. Um, blockchain protocols are heavy and slow. Transaction processing, as much as we want to make it fast, it still remains quite low. And the question is, is it possible to go to tens of thousands of transactions per second, hundred thousands of transactions per second? For some applications, this is important. So an interesting direction here that we're also pursuing is exploiting trust execution environments, for example, in TLSJX, ARM Trust Zone, to secure off-chain computation. This idea can also ex expand from basic payment channels to what's called state channels, which basically enable a set of participants to fast track the execution of a smart contract. So what's happening here is that computation is split between the blockchain, where basically is used only for settling the state of the uh, smart contract at regular intervals, and all specific transactions are actually being dealt off chain. So there is ongoing uh, negotiation efforts to have industry partners and explore together whether um, it's possible like, to expand our basic protocol to have hardware support and thus achieve uh, transaction acceleration in the tens or hundreds of thousands of transactions per second, as this would be important for a number of applications. Uh, a research thread that we haven't started, but it's something that's going to um, come up, is an enterprise version of, uh, of our basic protocol. So Cardano right now is an open ledger, but enterprise Cardano um, is basically an alternative to Hyperledger Fabric. It's going to be a system that will provide a permissioned ledger, uh, and it's um, not a cryptocurrency. So the idea is that stake is going to represent the relative degree of responsibility that every entity is going to have in the system, and it's possible to run over a fixed set of servers and enforce complex access control policies on read-write operations. Um, so I should say that this is an alternative hyperledger fabric because it uses a basically the different logic of consensus that is consistent with uh, um, um, Ouroboros and Bitcoin itself. And this brings me to exploring this whole design space of, uh, of protocols. For example, there's many interesting directions to look, like hybridizing with uh, more classical business and agreement protocols. There are many interesting protocols that would be interesting to consider in our context. Some of them are mentioned here, Thunderella and Algorand. Uh, and also exploring tree and DAG structures in place of uh, blockchain structure. So blockchain is just a chain. Uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, exploration now by the community uh, in uh, trying to understand whether there are advantages is using different data structure as the basic memory, as the basic state of the, uh, of the entities that are run the protocol. And there's a number of offerings that some of you might be familiar, Spectre, Hashgraph, IOTA, and others. So all these are currently under consideration and we are exploring them. Um, or will be exploring them in the future and seeing like what are their merits. Looking ahead, plan is, well, to expand. Like we have so many, many different interesting research questions and uh, there is no specific area of computer science basically that is not touched but, uh, by the work that we do. Um, so some immediate needs, programming languages, 
legal research, networking, hardware, economics and game theory, informal verification. These are important areas that currently like we are essentially understaffed and we would like to do more. Um, and of course, expand comes also with participate. Participate in committees, participate in research, participate in conference, and participate also in research grant competitions. Our first success as IOTSKI research is the Project Privilege, a Horizon 2020 EU consortium, which is the first EU project of IOTSKI, and perhaps the first core blockchain pro project that is running uh, in Europe. There are other projects that touch on the blockchain theme, but this is a core blockchain project. Our partners include IBM, Gartime, GRNet, and Smartmatic Cybernetica. And uh, there is a very ambitious uh, research agenda uh, for developing blockchain technology uh, in the three years of the project going to 2020, to 2021. Um, and finally, well, the objective is to disseminate and publish more than any other blockchain company in the space. So thanks. I know this was a lot. But, you know, myself, as I was going over the slides, I just was, I was keeping adding and, you know, I'm pretty sure there will be one or two things that, that I haven't included and I should have. So thanks for your attention and uh, I'll be delighted to, if you have questions or you have things that you want to discuss, there is an array of other presentations going to more depth uh, on these topics. And um, it would be great to... Uh, take this opportunity of this event here in uh, Lisbon to create an even faster cycle between all the different uh, members of IOHK. And uh, research is important to be tightly connected to the development uh, and the other parts of the company because by itself, like, it needs the compass of, uh, of the developing side of the company and the other sides of the company uh, to actually solve the problems that are most important for us to have the biggest impact that we can. Thank you. <laughs>